with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, June 20th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today to celebrate, recognize Juneteenth, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly will be joining us. Also on the program today for the first time ever, leftist wins in Colombia, was Gustavo Petro. Beats out a tycoon, a tycoon mayor en France. Melanchon's left party tops Macron, centrist. But it's Le Pen's coalition that is on the move. Not good. Not good. Meanwhile, in Texas, Republicans agree on a platform saying that Donald Trump won the 2020 elections, in addition to basically outlawing gay people. Pfizer, Moderna, COVID shots are now available for children six months to four years old. And in Maryland, the first Apple store ever has now unionized, or at least in this country. Oh, also on the program, Iowa Supreme Court overturns Iowa Constitution and says abortion rights are unprotected. This is two years after the Iowa Republicans court packed. It's doable, folks. Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin to stop scheduling abortions this week in anticipation of the federal Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade. Yellowstone National Park uh, devastated by flooding. Montana also. Floods in India and Bangladesh leave millions homeless. FINA, the International Federation of Swimming says trans women who experience male puberty cannot compete in women's swimming events. And six in 10 Americans say Trump should be prosecuted for January 6th, 60%. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for joining us. It is the beginning of the week. That is also known as Monday. Joining me, of course, as uh, always, except for last Friday, <laughs> Emma Viglin. And um, Wednesday of this week through two. So I'm off starting starting Wednesday for a week. All right. Well, Sorry. there you go, folks. You've been fair warned. Yes. You have been fair warned. Enjoy me while you can. That's right. Everything is fleeting, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at least uh, in terms of Emma's presence this week. Yes. Only this week. Uh, we got a lot to get to. There is um, one of the big sort of, uh, I guess, thought pieces we're reading now is how hard it is for Merrick Garland to bring any 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 type of prosecutions. Um, now we should say, like, I, I mean, I, this just reminds me of how hard it was for Eric Holder to bring any prosecutions with bankers at the time. Uh, because too big to fail. I mean, 
the the idea is is that you steal a lot, they make you king. You steal a little, they put you in jail. And it is we're in an era, and we've been in that era now for you know fifteen years. We had Lanny Brewer and uh, Eric Holder basically saying in public, "Look, we cannot prosecute." the CEOs of these uh, these banks or these insurance companies or whoever it was that uh, perpetrated frauds and broke our securities laws and had our and 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 uh, you know issued fake uh, mortgages or <clears throat> or failed in their fiduciary duties we can't prosecute them because if we do, you know, a lot of people could lose their jobs or their, you know, their their companies mm. could go under and um they 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 would articulate this publicly and so now we're from too big to fail to too republican to jail. <laughs> nice. Right? Uh, I, mean, I mean, but it's not just that they're republican, although the the reality is let's let's not kid ourselves. Trump's DOJ will. Oh, yeah. Trump's DOJ will. Or we're too cowardly to jail them. It, it is. It is. There is a, a you know, uh, I think we had, uh, was it Eisinger on the program who had written a uh, book? Chicken Shit Club? Yes. And uh, that's basically what we're looking at. I mean, the irony is that the under the under Trump um, prosecutions of, of white collar criminals even dropped even more. But that was just because they weren't interested in making that illegal anymore. But that's where we are. And um, it is the, the Democrats continue to relentlessly hope that aliens are going to come from a different planet and fix everything. That, that seems to be the strategy. That somehow the fever is going to break that we have, I mean, for decades now. And you can see what's coming out of Texas and their platform. And I will tell you, if you go back and I, and I went and I, I watched um, some of the uh, video I did, the documentary when I went to the uh, RNC in 2004. I just watched like five or ten minutes of it because I went to the Texas people we're talking about uh, gay people in Texas, and I, I interviewed a, a log cabin Republican. We're going to talk about how log cabin Republicans now have been what excised from the party in Texas. Um, we, we will talk about all this. But 15, 16 years ago, I would read the Texas platform, uh, the Republicans, and people would just be like, that's an outlier. That is the last vestige of the party. And now it's quite clear they are not the outliers of the. They are the vanguard of the party. The alpha males are back. The alpha males are back, but the point point is they've never left. This has been apparent for over a decade, for two decades now, and so much of our media and the Democratic Party. And I really do think, you know, largely a generational thing, but also, you know, uh, may cross-reference also with some other politics. Just completely sort of just shocked at the, the Republican Party. I wrote a book in 2006 that I, I feel like I could release that book again. Change a couple of names, everything the same. That's how long this stuff has been going around. And so the Democrats need to do something. It also undercuts their message significantly when they talk about the existential threat to democracy. And then they're like, but we're a little too afraid to do anything about well, it. Well, it's even worse than that. It's There's an existential threat to democracy. But these guys are reasonable to negotiate with gun, about guns. These guys are uh, reasonable enough to negotiate about whatever it is. And they keep whittling down the group of people that should be held accountable for January 6th, for example, right? Like, like the more they include the 
Bill Barr, Mike Pence into the people, the group of people that were sane enough to stand up to Donald Trump, as opposed to emphasizing the complicity up into the point where it only broke for them because it was untenable for them personally at that point. Instead of making that the emphasis, then they're also not making it about the Republican Party. Exactly. And we're going to hear this later in the program about uh, Clarence Thomas and this and that. So there is an existential threat to democracy, but it only comes from like three people. Odd. That's weird. And the riffraff and the people that stormed the Capitol, not the people that incited it. Don't look up. Look down. I mean, not to say that, that you know, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers all deserve to be punished for this 100 percent. But the emphasis should be on the Republican right. Party not at large. They're growing yeah. in a vacuum. Yeah. If the Republican Party was not a problem, the Proud Boys would not be an existential threat to democracy. Right. The existential threat to democracy is the Republican Party. It is an institution now that is, whether their hearts are into it or not, that, uh, uh, that are, are hell-bent on... Uh, on on both reversing um, individual liberties and undercutting our democracy. That's just the bottom line. And uh, the Democratic Party needs to act and articulate that as if that's the case. You cannot just whine that people don't understand that it's an existential threat to democracy, but also we need bipartisanship. Like, I'm sorry. It's just these two things cannot exist in the same moment and place. They can't. They cannot. All right, here is, uh, well, you know, we don't have time for these videos. <laughs> we'll play those later. We'll it's play fine. The, the rant, uh, well, this was a sufficient segment. That was. I yeah, I would say. Um, folks, we're going to, a uh, couple words from our sponsors, and then um, uh, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly, uh, professor of American history at UCLA, will be joining us to talk about Juneteenth, I really feel like we should have um, pre-taped and, and gone on vacation. I mean, taking the day off. Well, I will we'll talk about that in a minute. Because I, I walking down here today, uh, fly, I was like, it's yeah, completely. It's odd that, like, everyone I know has Juneteenth off and this show doesn't have well, Juneteenth my off. Well, <laughs> my feeling is that people still don't, you know, ha, do, you know. No, I'm joking. Hadn't, hadn't you know weren't aware of, of the holiday or what it's about, but I also have some questions about the holiday too. And that's why we're doing this uh, next year. Also, take, no, it just, it, it it's, it we'll slipped pre-tip. my mind because Juneteenth was on Sunday. So I think that's maybe why we forgot. The, no, the no, week. I knew it was, oh. I, I made the decision to, to, uh, oh. to, to come into work. Oh, okay. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> that said, many people <laughs> are excited to travel this summer. Correct. Correct. Have you thought about all the people who make your vacation truly great? Maybe you go to a nice hotel. The concierge knows the best place to eat. Maybe you got a tour guide. Maybe uh, somebody's, I don't know, renting you a, uh, one of those uh, ski, zip, what are those ski, I don't know. What are those things called? Water skis. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so you, get a, you get something at the uh, gift shop from the clerk. Well, I went on vacation. This is the T-shirt I got or whatever it is. Outstanding talent is crucial for a successful business. And if you're hiring, you can find talent for roles like these and more at ZipRecruiter when you try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review these recommended candidates. Invite your top choices to apply four out of five employers. Who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. We've been advertising for ZipRecruiter, I don't know, for five or six years now, I think. And when it came time to hire uh, Brendan's role, I went on ZipRecruiter. It was an incredible experience uh, because I was very intimidated by the whole process, and it made it super easy. I had a bunch of different candidates who were great. I interviewed a ton of them. ZipRecruiter went out, pulled um, uh, Brendan in. And um, he was uh, perfect for the job. Brendan is how we got Bradley, and so so on and so on. Uh, one great hire that ZipRecruiter did, and it made it very, very easy. So travel to this easy-to-remember web destination, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. 
That's where you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority, M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y, ZipRecruiter. It is the smartest way to hire. Also, today's program sponsored by the same company that has provided me this hmm. uh, for today. I know I am... I'm off my uh, immunity boosting kick from Liquid IV. You're back to the matcha. Back to the matcha. I should say, anecdotally, again, I was at a, a close friend's wedding this weekend, and she gave us some goodie bags. Guess what was in there? Liquid IV. Liquid IV. Smart. I know, right? That is actually very smart. Very smart. One stick of Liquid IV, hydration multiplier, and 16 ounces of water hydrates you faster and more efficiently than water alone. Liquid IV comes in a bunch of different flavors, like watermelon, which I uh, sign off on. Lemon lime, also sign off on. Strawberry, I don't know. Strawberry, it's not for me. But pina colada, mm -hmm. I know that sounds weird, but I love pina coladas. And then the matcha, of course. And uh, the tangerine. I, I go Right now, I'm just going back and forth. Watermelon, tangerine, matcha. But I got to get back on that pina colada. Anyways. Uh, Liquid IV contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. That's why your friend's handing them out in gift bags I know. at your wedding. And I'd already packed them, so I just had, like, I thought of it, and she thought of it. It was you could, amazing. You could, you could maybe turn around and flip those, sell them at the uh, wedding. It, they were useful for some of my friends that were staying. We were all staying together in the next morning, for sure. You get three times the electrolytes uh, with Liquid IV than you do from traditional sports drinks. It is made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, free from gluten, dairy, and soy. The science of cellular uh, transport technology is what makes Liquid IV so effective. And also, they're on a mission to change the world. The company's donated over 20 million servings globally. Again, great for travel, great for um, uh, post and pre-workouts. Um, if you've been drinking too much or... For me, it's just like I want to stay hydrated, and this is the way I stay hydrated every day. I drink it during uh, during the show. Grab Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com. Use the code MAJORITYREP at checkout. It's 25% off anything when you use the promo code MAJORITYREP at liquidiv.com. Experience better hydration today. Liquidiv.com, promo code MAJORITYREP. That's Majority Rep. Lastly, one out of three Americans report being sleep deprived. I, I, I would be one of those people. Mm -hmm. And um, their sheets could be the problem. Not so much for me anymore. I got about 40 other reasons why I stay up at night. But luckily, uh, Cozy Earth provides the softest, most luxurious uh, and best temperature regulating sheets. Cozy Earth has been featured on Oprah's most favorite things list for four years in a row. They are made from so super soft viscos from bamboo. I don't know what viscos is. I don't the know. Threads? But it's yeah, like I, would, threads. I would imagine, yeah. But it's made from bamboo, so they're sustainable. And here's the thing Cozy Earth sheets, they breathe. So you sleep at night with the perfect temperature all year round. That is the key for me talked about in the past we had other sheets that we were supporting the show we ended that relationship we're looking for sheets that were soft but also keep me cool because i cannot sleep hot it has thousands of five-star reviews it is no wonder that cozy air sheets have become the bedding of choice for interior designers and podcast hosts like that myself. too Cozy Earth even offers a 100-night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on it. You wash it, you try it out. If you're not completely in love, send it back for a full refund. There's a 10-year warranty, and Cozy Earth sheets come in four new colors. Check it out. For a limited time, save 35% on Cozy, Cozy Earth bedding. Go to CozyEarth.com slash majority. Enter my special promo code majority at checkout to save 35% now. That's CozyEarth.com slash majority. Be sure to enter majority at checkout for 35% off. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Robin D.G. Kelly, professor of American history at UCLA, about Juneteenth.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us by phone, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly, Professor of American History at UCLA. Professor, welcome back to the program. I'm here with Emma Viglund. Yes, thanks. It's all great to, to talk to you, and apologies for the technical problem. Uh, no worries. That's It's probably on our end. So, Let's, um, you know, I was I was just saying beforehand, I was debating as to uh, whether we should come into work for today on Juneteenth. And <laughs> it is a it's a new holiday, uh, I guess, officially made a federal holiday last year. There's there's many states, I think, still where you don't get the day off um, and, right. you know, wanted to wanted to educate people about it. And um, what well, let if you could. Just give us the sort of the, I mean, uh, you know, I guess the, in a nutshell, uh, Juneteenth, uh, what it celebrates, and then I want to talk about sort of the, the broader implications of it, and then, and then also how it may, might relate to your work, which has been, uh, and we've interviewed uh, you for the, the story mm -hmm. of, of, um, of Alabama and uh, communists, uh, black Alabama and communists trying to organize in, um, uh, during the Depression era, um, right. and and these ideas of of how racism is so intricate to capitalism. But before we get there, let's start with just the remedial Juneteenth. What what is it? Right, exactly. So let's let's let me just confirm that this is an important day of work. Um, it's not supposed to be a day of just relaxation, because in many ways Juneteenth is uh, declared a certain kind of Freedom Day. So let's let's give the background. Um, you know, the general story is that, you know, in the state of Texas, um, African Americans allegedly were unaware that um, the Civil War was over, and that uh, Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. This is not exactly true, by the way, but this is a part of the myth. And so basically on June 19th, 1865, after the Union forces had occupied Galveston, Texas, in, you know, invaded and basically declared uh, the war over, defeating um, the Confederacy there in the state of Texas, that's when um, General, uh, Major General Granger read this proclamation that, um, after, that, that slavery was over. That again, I, I say this a myth because Galveston was one of the major uh, international port cities, had a, a, uh, a significant working class, uh, including a European working class, very much aware of what was happening around the globe. So it's not that people didn't know; um, it was that the Union forces weren't able to occupy Texas until that time. Uh, to go back to what it really represents, yes, it does represent in many ways what black Texans think of as the moment of emancipation, but what it was initially called was Jubilee Day. It wasn't called Juneteenth. Uh, and it was a reference to um, Leviticus uh, chapter 25 of the Bible, which promised, you know, in, in terms of Jubilee, it promised restitution of the land, that is that the land shall revert to the original owner. It promises cancellation of all debts. It promised um, in Jubilee, the freeing of all, uh, freeing of all slaves and bond servants, right? Uh, so the the presumption is that this this biblical moment is a moment when all slaves are freed, uh, and it's a, an expression of divine sovereignty. That is that the true owners of the land, uh, the land is, is 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 God's land, right? So these celebrations were deeply religious but deeply political. They were they held parades, picnics, performances, and these political gatherings were moments to talk about the right to vote for black people, the right to land, um, the right to some kind of reparations, um, the, the, the need to create political institutions uh, for leadership. And that's what Ju uh, Juneteenth came to represent. Um, and it was the promise of reconstruction, which we know was overthrown uh, and collapsed under the weight of, of Jim Crow. And in the 1930s, the Juneteenth celebrations came back, you know, with a force, um, and it was tied to working class movements. In fact, um, in the 30s, uh, as black people migrated out 
from Texas to places like California uh, and throughout the, the, the Midwest and, and West Coast, they brought Juneteenth with them. Uh, Juneteenth is maybe a federal holiday, but it's not a new holiday for black communities around the country, especially on the West Coast. It's not an accident like the Poor People's Campaign uh, in 68 held a Juneteenth solidarity rally uh, in Washington, D.C., you know, in, for the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, the Black Radical Congress, which I attended in 1998, we, we held the founding meeting on Juneteenth. So Juneteenth represents, you know, a day of struggle, a day of resistance, a recognition that the freedoms promised in the 13th Amendment, freedoms promised in the so-called Emancipation Proclamation uh, were just unfulfilled and was just a promise of liberation, not not real freedom. You know, that the the and i don't think i was aware and we've i I think we've probably done uh now this is the fourth or fifth year in a row that we've had someone on to talk about uh juneteenth and i don't know that i knew that it was called jubilee because i ran into this situation with my kid actually Mm. uh my nine-year-old explaining um explaining juneteenth as just sort of, I guess, the, the straightforward, uh, this is when in Texas they were the last people to hear that the, the, the chattel slaves were freed. And, uh, and he, it was his reaction of like, yeah, that was a good thing, and now it, that's over, where it sort of like feels like, well, actually, nah, I mean, it's a little <laughs> more complicated than that. And it, it did occur to me, and I don't want to be, you know, uh, I mean, th- this is maybe a little bit cynical, but this is, when I contemplate our holidays, like Independence Day, well, that was a one-time event, and it and it fundamentally shifted the dynamic of, you know, uh, what America was. But like the Memorial Days, you know, we don't really spend, I think, the time that we should contemplating these things. Mm-hmm. But at least there's an opportunity to do that on some level. Right. Like celebrating the end of chattel slavery, sort of feels like it sort of like tries to put things in a box and sort of, I don't know, say, well, we finished right. that and that's that. Right, right. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. It, it puts it in a box as if somehow it's passed, but it does something else too. And that is that the, the narrative, and even, even coming from, from decent liberals and some leftists, um, the narrative is skewed because it does two things that are really – uh, problematic. One, it presents the Emancipation Proclamation as the thing that ended slavery. When we know that it was just a wartime document, basically, that did not apply to 450,000 enslaved people in Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, in Tennessee. Uh, it didn't apply uh, to places that were loyal to the Union. And not only that, but it only applied to the Confederate states, and unless the Union Army was there to emancipate people, um, they they were still enslaved. So the fact of the matter is that enslaved people freed themselves. When Union troops started to enter into uh, uh, Confederate territory and uh, win battles, black people flocked to Union lines because they knew they could get protection. They, they freed themselves. They undermined the Confederacy. That's a story we don't we don't tell. Then what ends up happening is that the Emancipation Proclamation becomes a great document. The Thirteenth Amendment just drops out, you know, altogether. And so that's that's part of the story. The other part of the story is, you know, when we talk about the history of Texas, Texas is tricky. Texas is the only state that started out as an independent, started out as part of Mexico, then part then became an independent republic for the purposes of keeping slaves when Mexico had abolished slavery in 1827 and then was annexed, but was annexed and became a state as a result of war when the U.S. waged war with Mexico and took Texas, California, Nevada, New Mexico, and all those other places, right? So this is the the result that Texas was one of these states designed to be uh, a a safe haven for slavery. So during the, um, the Civil War, um, after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued and some Confederate states were losing, what did the slaveholders do? They flocked to Texas. They took their enslaved people 
and cross the 180,000 enslaved people were brought into Texas, uh, and, you, and you don't think that those people who knew and passed on information about the Emancipation Proclamation didn't know that this thing had been issued? Of course they did. They, this is why they knew they were leaving. And so that's the moment where a number of those who could escape, black people could escape, they fled south to Mexico. They you couldn't fl- flee north. There was no place to go. And when, so by the time Union troops showed up, to retake Galveston, because by the way, I should mention that Galveston was occupied by Union forces uh, in 1862 for several months until January 1st, 1863, the day the Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to be implemented, they were defeated (laughs) by the Confederacy. Mm. So this myth of like people not knowing is, is, is dangerous. And it also takes away the agency from enslaved people from who were the forces that destroyed the Confederacy in the first place. What What's your reaction to, I mean, you mentioned Texas, and that's what made me think of this. Um, this Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday against the backdrop of a mass conservative movement to rewrite history in the form of these anti-critical race theory bills. Um, because, you know... I, I am I'm reminded of almost the way that Reagan was the president who mm-hmm. implemented MLK Day, right? And it's it saps it and almost, you know, uh papers over the struggle and the meaning behind it. There there's a dichotomy there that I think is a little troubling uh because it it, yeah. it there's no real reckoning with the fact that history is being rewritten as we speak. Right, right. No, that's a really good point. In fact, um, there's one slight difference between, say, um, a conservative Reagan overseeing King's holiday versus someone who's perceived to be, right, that's the Biden-Harris administration, perceived to be liberal pushing back against a right-wing wave. So So this is what it appears to be, and I'll tell you what it really is. So it appears to be Um, that this holiday is a bulwark against, right, the the wave of anti-so-called CRT uh, 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 CRT pedagogy, right? In other words, that this is the bulwark against the right-wing attack on history, when in fact it in some ways masks that attack. And and let me explain what I mean. it's easy for the Biden administration and all of its friends to say, you know, we're, we're not, we're against the criminalizing of teaching of anything considered to be quote unquote divisive. We're against the attacks on critical race theory, which is not really critical race theory, it's just liberal multiculturalism. Um, and we can prove it because we support this holiday. Uh, and so what you're going to see is right wing are saying this holiday is, is a, a travesty. Uh, you're not allowed to teach about um, uh, Juneteenth or emancipation or any of that stuff. And so we end up uh, pre- imagining that as li- that the liberal wing is our best hope, when in fact we've been spending years pushing back against a certain kind of liberal erasure of this history. The liberal erasure is the one that says Lincoln freed the slaves, President Johnson gave us a civil rights bill, you know, yeah. um, the, you know, the, the, the kind of working class grassroots struggles that made these things possible are erased. But there's another side to the story, something I've been harping on, is that all these conservatives who are trying to outlaw uh, what is essentially an anti-racist curriculum, right, because they say that children will feel uncomfortable, um, are not willing at the same time to outlaw racist curriculum. That is to say, no one's talking about removing Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia or John C. Calhoun or Edmund Ruffin or all these like pro-slavery writings from libraries or from teaching. You know, that's like the other side, right? In fact, these same people who are against anti-racist history are the same ones who would argue that, you know, like, 
the 13th and 14th Amendment, that was kind of legislative overreach. You know? yeah. <laughs> they want to say that. So we're, we're in, a, in a, a, a real hard struggle right now. And my fear is that if we fall into the trap of saying that what we need are simply more federal holidays that could celebrate the unity of this nation rather than the history of its um, uh, problematic and racist past, uh, something that could bring us together rather than understand why, what the consequences for the defeat of Reconstruction were. You know, something that could help us really understand, you know, why is it that 10 black people get shot down in Buffalo and how that's related to Reconstruction? That's what we need to know. We don't need to sort of make the case that, uh, see, America's, uh, you know, moral arc bends towards justice. Mm. And we know that in time, we're going to prevail. And that's the lesson. That's not the lesson. That, I, I mean, I have to say, and I thought, you know, part of it was just sort of, I, you know, uh, I, I have become so um, just interested in, in Reconstruction. I was like, it, maybe it would have been better to have a holiday to commemorate, you know, the, the coup in South Carolina, uh, during mm. Reconstruction, essentially, you know, uh, or, um, you know, uh, massacres. Any of the and, bombings and, of churches, yeah. of black churches. Yeah, right. I mean, just the, uh, you know, something that would bring about that history, because, yes, we all know uh, chattel slavery ended. Like, OK, we get it. Um, and but that's. That did not solve the the fundamental problems, and and um, so. But uh, with that said, at the very least, it, having a holiday called Juneteenth allows us to have these type of conversations and and examine it. So it's it's doing some of the work, I, I guess, that we right, would right. want. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I have to say, you know, it, it it does it does the work, and actually, if we do it right. It can do the, to me, this is just my own take, to me, Juneteenth is an opportunity, if we do it right, to raise these issues in a more powerful way. My, my, my concern about commemorating these acts of violence um, is that it could possibly fall back into the same liberal trap, and that is to show the kind of history of victimization mm -hmm. and that we've been able to overcome it. But here's the strength of Juneteenth. And it's so funny because I'm supposed to be giving a uh, a talk about it in the next couple hours in Pasadena, right? And um, Juneteenth, I treat Juneteenth not as the end of slavery, but the beginnings of a new war for Reconstruction. That's how we treat. So if you think of Juneteenth as the beginnings of the fight for freedom, not the end of slavery, but the beginnings of the fight for freedom, then we have to deal with what comes next. And that is why I remind us that the original name was the Day of Jubilee, because Jubilee wasn't about the celebration of the end of, of the nightmare of slavery. These were political meetings every year on June 19th and gatherings that said, what are we going to do to preserve our freedom? What are we going to do to turn our liberation into actual freedom? What's our next steps? And that's why Jubilee made these claims, these arguments claims for reparations, claims to redistribute land, and that, you know, one could extend that as well to include indigenous people, because one of the stories about Texas is that, you know, I'm sure you might know about the, the, the Salt Creek Massacre, as it was called, and this is in Texas, 1871, when um, some of the Plains Indians were, you know, again, trying to come back, get their land back, and they waged an attack you know, against settlers, uh, the great general, and I say this, you know, tongue in cheek, the great general William T. Sherman, who's known for redistributing land uh, to black people uh, in South Carolina, uh, you know, during Civil War, he's heroic in that sense, who all, also has a history as one of the most vicious, merciless um, uh, in, uh, killers of indigenous people. Uh, actually used the, the so-called Salt Creek Massacre as justification to wage one of the most vicious wars on Native peoples in Texas and throughout the South. And so in many ways, the post 
the the moment of seeking freedom after that day of June 10th, the day of uh, June 19th, uh, led to this, opened up the door for this massacre by the same Reconstruction general who's heroic, uh, you know, to basically, you know, murder uh, 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 Native people. Um, And he had a lot of practice at it, by the way, you know, in the Seminole Wars and whatnot. But the main point here is that we can take Juneteenth as an unfulfilled promise. Juneteenth is the opportunity to talk about reparations. Juneteenth is the opportunity to talk about decolonization. It's the opportunity to talk about the violence that was meted out, that, was, that we've had inherited, including the January 6th rebellion. January 6th dates back to the failure of Reconstruction because you mentioned the coup in Wilmington, North Carolina. Well, there was a coup in um, Grimes County, Texas, uh, very similar to what happened in Wilmington, where the, a group called, calling themselves the White Man's Union, as if you know you needed any clarification what they <laughs> represented, the White Man's Union, led by Democrats, literally went to the, 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 the um, seat of Grimes County and killed all the elected officials who were populist, black and white, and took over the government. That's the legacy of the defeat of Reconstruction, the defeat of Jubilee, the defeat of Juneteenth, right? That's the story that we need to tell rather than just, oh, these poor black people didn't know, have a clue about what was happening. And thank goodness for the union, thank, thank goodness for the military who told them they were free. You know? That's not the narrative. Um, uh, and, and I should say that, you, I, you know, I've read uh, where you maybe I think it was last year uh, you wrote about um, sort of uh, applying those that same dynamic about uh, about Juneteenth and, and the concept of Jubilee also to the um, the t- in, on behalf of the Palestinian people as well. Mm-hmm. Who are subject to their own? We have a, a similar dynamic in terms of like indigenous and um, and uh, you know I- exploited and and dispossessed people um, uh, amongst right. the Palestinians. Um, w- let's b- just broaden this conversation just a little bit in terms of uh, of of your ideas about uh, racism and its relationship to capitalism, because I think this is. You know, um, it, when you talk about everything that, I guess, continues on from uh, that mm-hmm. that that day uh, from Juneteenth, um, this plays a big part. Right, definitely. Um, well, there's many ways I can enter into that. I mean, the the if there's a lesson here that could link the question of capitalism, racism, and in Juneteenth, it's very simple that. You know, we have to understand the history of capitalism uh, in its current iteration as being um, rooted in in the very systems of oppression that preceded capitalism, which includes racism and includes patriarchy, gender oppression. Uh, and so in many ways, when we think about, for example, um, the I mean, just some obvious examples for right now, the, the commercialization of Juneteenth, the Juneteenth sales and things like that. <laughs> That's the most crass example of the way in which uh, black suffering and exploitation and extraction uh, becomes uh, once again repackaged, recommodified so, so people could either buy themselves a little bit of um, uh, uh you know, peace of mind to say that, you know, I've contributed something to uh, the people whose, whose, uh, whose wealth I was able to expo- exploit. Um, or, you know, there's also the question of, of the current struggle for reparations and understanding what were the systems that led to this massive wealth extraction. Slavery is an obvious one. You know, you have unrequited labor uh, that created wealth. For um, and then when I say wealth, I mean wealth not not just for like I'm not talking about the working class or poor white people. I'm talking about uh, from railroad companies to big agriculture uh, to shipping to insurance. I mean that's where the wealth 
accumulated. But then you move into the area, the period of Jim Crow, and how housing policies and segregation also led to transfer of wealth. Um, a study done in, in California, uh, 2014, showed that in just an LA metropolitan area right now, the wealth gap is, you know, in terms of, of wealth, uh, African Americans have like $200 worth of wealth, median wealth, uh, versus whites who have $110,000. That's not all slavery. Some of it's about the fact that if you live in certain neighborhoods, the value of your property goes up. That value goes up because um, of federal and state policies that determine value in the real estate industry, determine value based on race. That's an old practice and still happening today. So people are losing money um, all the time, and that money is being transferred, let alone the, the use of regressive taxation, which goes on to this day, where you got poor people, many of whom are black and brown, who pay sales taxes and pay all these kinds of taxes, whereas tax breaks are happening with corporate America and with property owners in many ways. Um, and so the kind of, and then at the same time, those same communities that pay this regressive tax uh, are not getting the benefits of their tax money. They're, they're dealing with defunded, defunded schools, right. uh, the lack of you know, uh, services in the communities. And, and there's a whole range of things that are going on. And that's just examples from today, uh, let alone the historical examples we could talk about. Well, you know, the, um, one of the, the arguments that you, um, that you make, broadly speaking, uh, you know, to generalize, of course, you know, sort of mm -hmm. uh, across your writing, is, is that for, for capitalism to exist— you need to have a um, a, uh, a a a a some type of like uh, I guess structure of thinking where you can exploit, which is inherent to capitalism. You can exploit other people um, if they are not quite people in the way that you're a person. Like if they're mm -hmm. somehow less. Um, the, like that dynamic, because I, I'm sort of fascinated by this because on some level, like that's also how feudalism worked too. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, and, and I would imagine, I'm not even sure what we, we call, you know, the period of, of late antiquity or, uh, you know, uh, early history when we're talking about Philistines and, um, and, you know, uh, th that era, but uh, presumably, um, uh, for, you know, in the context of, of indigenous uh, folk in, in this country, you know, sometimes the, uh, the way that they refer to themselves as people and, uh, other, other, uh, groups are not people like that dynamic is, seems to have always been the case with humanity of othering people from whom you want to take things. Uh, and the other right. has to start. But capitalism is just like is is a continuance of that. How, it, explain that and also how it how capitalism sort of reproduces that racism and that that in this in our instance, white privilege or, you know, uh, Eddie Gloud calls it the value gap. Uh, there's a lot of different mm -hmm. sort of terms for it. Um, how does capitalism reproduce that? so as to maintain this dynamic where you can justify exploiting other people. Right, right. No, no, that's a good point. And this is, this is the lesson I learned from my late teacher, um, Cedric Robinson, who wrote about, he, he wasn't the first one to introduce the, the co concept of racial capitalism, but he emphasized in his book, Black Marxism, published back in 1983, that... Um, that it's exactly what you said, that, that capitalism emerges within a particular civilization uh, that is in Europe in which difference was used for, for millennia to justify uh, or to structure, I should say, you know, um, the value of people, um, their ability, their place in, in the world and their place in, in production. So, for example, you know, um, you mentioned feudalism. I mean, you know, anti-Semitism, for example, is another way in which, you know, um, 
whole group of people get placed within a particular hierarchy. So basically what this means is that capitalism emerges within a regime that's already racial and already gendered. This is not to say that, that the, the concepts of race don't change, because they do change. And in fact, the 18th century becomes scientific racism. And in certain groups of people who are considered divided, like, you know, the, the Irish were considered lower orders than the, the English, they begin to consolidate in this category called whiteness, you know. And um, Irishness doesn't disappear, but it, it's, its devaluation disappears over time. Um, and so, so these, these systems of difference are always dynamic. And of course, there's a gendered regime in which women's labor or anyone identified as woman uh, or feminized end up being devalued as well, which allows for increased extraction of value. So when you talk about, uh, when you ask the question about how does it continue, you know, one of the big tragedies of racial, the system of racial capitalism is the way that it captures a segment of the white working class, you know, and actually it ties its identity uh, to race, that is whiteness, into masculinity, that is manliness. And so what ends up happening is that too many white working people see their value in whiteness and and therefore see themselves as different from different from anyone who's not them who's not white and you know this is great um quote by Serge Robinson where he says you know white patrimony deceives some of the majority of Americans right patriotism and nationalism others but then he says the more future reality was the theft they themselves endured in the voracious expropriation of others they facilitated. In the scrap, which was their reward, was the installation of black inferiority into their shared national culture. It's a paltry dividend, but it still, still serves. And that dividend is, the div is what the boys call the wages of whiteness. That is, that they believe that one day they will become a CEO or a slaveholder if they work hard enough, that the, the material benefits are not just something that may happen, but supposed to happen because it's their privilege, it's their entitlement. Um, and then they see every day the institutional power and the violence of, of racism and racial violence against black, brown, and indigenous peoples. That's not to say like, I don't wanna be them, no. Um, and, I, I, and, and that idea of differentiation is then reinforced by the state. Um, but there are other elements to this, you know, uh, as well. The, the most dangerous one for me is indifference because, you know, yes, we can find all kinds of examples of white racism, but the indifference among white liberals to me is, is way more dangerous because what ends up happening, I say more dangerous, but equally dangerous because they end up actually accepting the fact that racism is racism. It's really tragic. I'm not one of them, but you know, it's unfortunately anti-blackness will always keep black people down and I just wish it was different and they walk away um, and they stand in the sidelines rather than insist that institutional racism is something that you have to fight and destroy in order to win the class war. And it's not something that you can eliminate through a workshop, through trainings, it's something that you have to fight for. And that is to say, anti-racism, ending patriarchy, anti -tra ending transphobia, homophobia, these are all part of a class war to bring about the kind of vision that was embedded in Jubilee in the first place. When you say, I mean, my, my perspective on, 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 on the, the white liberal is that they are more inclined to at least a, a identify or attempt or uh, to as as anti-racist than they are in seeing the this as a inherent problem with capitalism yes that that is true I, I don't disagree with that um, uh, you know but we have this other problem um, I think you know which extends both to liberals and to some white radicals as well. And that is 
accepting the idea that um, anti-black racism, racism is, is a permanent condition that can't be changed. And that, or worse, uh, worse than that, the idea that the only way to change it is by ending capitalism. Um, and, and that would be a great, great idea if it were true, you know, <laughs> because just like racism and gender inequalities and gender uh, oppressions predated capitalism, it'll post-date it as well, unless it's addressed. Right. You know? I mean, let's so, talk about uh, that, because that, I mean, that is the, I mean, t- to me, you know, within the sort of center to the left, that has been the, there are basically, uh, you know, there there are two broad positions that I've, I've you know, uh, come across. One is that uh, we need to fight racism without any regard for capitalism and how capitalism reproduces racism and perpetuates it and needs it. And then there, on the other end of the spectrum, there is um, we don't need to think about or, 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 or we don't. There's nothing that we can do to address racism without getting rid of capitalism first. Um, but 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 if I understand your argument is these are things that need to happen simultaneously. Simultaneously all the time, you know, and, you know, the the this idea of of privileging race over class, a class over race, to me never made sense because. You know, when you're in the middle of a fight, uh, you fight the modes of oppression that you're dealing with. And for a lot of black people, indigenous people are fighting for land. Um, and brown people, uh, they're dealing with racism. In other words, the class expression, the, the way that class oppression is affecting them is through racism. You know, that's why Sir Hall had this line about, you know, Racism is 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 uh, the modality through which you know class, ex, you know exists, or you know how it operates, and so you know many ways. Um, to me, it's not a debate. Th- there are ways, though, in which um, fighting racism could reinforce capitalism if you're not careful. Like, for example, the idea that that what we need are just you know more black cops, more black elected officials whose position might be completely reactionary, right? Um, you know, or that somehow black capitalism is a thing that's going to save us all. Of course, no one, anyone who's on the left, they don't believe that. And most, most black progressive or radicals don't believe that either. That's not the debate for me. Um, but to say, for example, that the struggle in Ferguson around Mike Brown's murder wasn't about, wasn't anti-capitalist, is to misunderstand what actually happened. I mean, you have people in the streets who are fighting a system in which the police extract wealth, right, and pay for itself through ticketing and fines, you know, and this is the, the thing that led to Mike Brown's murder in the first place. So they're out there fighting a system of rapacious capitalism expressed through the violence and, and fascism of, of police practice. And then people are saying, well, this is not about anti-capitalism. These are the same people out there fighting for $15 an hour for, as a minimum wage. Same people. So there's a way in which if we, if we don't understand how the system's functioning, we're going to make the mistake of thinking that class struggle is the colorblind thing. You know? And anti-racism is the anti-class thing. And that's not actually how it functions. And this concept of racial capitalism will allow us to see better how these things function, you know, co-constitutively, right. Robin D.G. Kelly, professor of American history at UCLA, thank you so much for uh, for your time today. Really appreciate it, and um, happy Juneteenth. uh, uh, Yes, thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, take care. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Going to take a quick break, head into the fun half of the show. Maybe I'll take a little uh, I am from the uh, from the uh, the chattering class uh, before we go into the fun half.
A little I am? Yeah, I'll take a little That's I am. That's what Sam's been calling I am. It's just yeah. chattering. Chattering class. He's trying to oh. do cross politics. It's, yeah, exactly. It's going strange. Uh, <laughs> I just saw this from Dirt Devil. That's why it just caught my eye as it was going on there. Uh, how tall are you, Sam? No inflating your stats. We're taking bets in the chat. Oh. Yeah, that is Emma's. Um, that's... That's really your yeah, legacy. Yeah. It's like there's a whole. There's I, I've created. Uh, yeah, like gambling a, like, addicts. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry. If I'm wrong, I have to donate a five dollar super chat. Okay. Emma, want in on these chat bets? How tall is Sam? I mean, I probably have a better. I, I have, this might be insider trading. <laughs> it might be a little bit. Um, Take a guess. Let's see. Six one. Six one. Wow. wow. No. <laughs> Matt's laughing at that. Yeah, no, he's not. Wait, what? Foot. You're you're <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Matt. He might be six foot. Well, Matt's six three. No, I'm six two. That's probably why you're Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm five I'm in between five eight and five nine, and I thought you were at least three inches taller than that. I know that's five, amazing ten. because uh people generally get it uh wrong. I am actually like five eleven and like three oh, quarters. Five, ah, okay. Yeah. So I basically say like Jewish six foot. Yeah. That's okay. Right. 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 Yeah. Round up. That's why I round up to six feet. I mean, it's closer than any other. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's possible. I'm like uh, five eleven point six seven. How tall are you, Bradley? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. I'm 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 five. I say five ten, but my doctor told me I was five nine and three quarters. Oh. You're shrinking, which is really emasculating yeah. to me. <laughs> I couldn't round up. I think five so ten is sometimes like the the. That's when men are like, all right, average, average, right? That's what people say. I I, I think many so, yeah. people are saying. Well, that. I want to know what happened in the bet, well, and I know you do too, folks, and that's why you should join us in the fun half. You can find out. Uh, you can uh, have fun in the fun half and find out huge things. Like <laughs> our, our metrics. Who, yes. Who, who won? Who won? Maybe we'll bet? even say our weight. There we go. No. Um, I haven't weighed myself in ten years. You haven't? No. I guess yeah. I must have at the doctor's office, but yeah, I yeah. don't remember. Uh, that's depressing, folks. <laughs> You can support this program by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you get the fun half free of commercials. You also um, get uh, the fun half as well. So uh, check it out. Uh, Jointhemajorityreport.com. It is your support that makes this show survive and thrive. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop. Fair trade. Do people drink coffee anymore? I'm drinking some right now. There you go. <laughs> Fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. You got to check out some of these. But first off, uh, Just Coffee is uh, was a co-op that was involved. They were giving out free coffee during the the, the big protest now, 11 years ago in um, uh, in Wisconsin. They I went out there and visited. I don't know how many years ago this was. Now five years ago, I guess. Um, was at Just Coffee and heard about all the support that they give their growers. Chiapas region and uh, other places in, in Central America, um, they they do not abandon their growers. It is uh, really impressive what they do uh, to support the people that they buy the coffee from. It's all fair trade. Um, and uh, the coffees are great. 10% off. You can also get the Majority Report blend. Or you can get Mark Marin's blend, whatever. <laughs> Uh, but check it out, justcoffee.coop, C-O-O-P. Does Marin still advertise it on his show? You know what? I'm Sam debating as to know. whether I should pretend like I listen to Marin's show anymore. <laughs> um, I think you know. might have already revealed it. I don't know. He's just, he, like, he, he's, he's, you know, he's into the, like, realm of interviewing people that I'm sure are nice and this and that, but I'm just not, you know. And there's only so many times I can skip over uh, Marin's introductions. I can only tell you that tell so many times. I said that to his face on his TV show. When I appeared on his TV show and I ad-libbed it right in the middle of the scene. And uh, you guys are arguing, right? And you were like, oh, you just talk about like bullshit or whatever. Right, yeah, I can't remember exactly what it was that I had said, it, but it was basically like I skipped through the, uh, the intro like everybody does. And I heard his writers <laughs> laugh when I said that. It's been about four or five years since we had Marin on. Has it? All right. Well, maybe I'll get him on. Well, now I can't. I got to get some distance between this and that. 
what's happening in the Matt Leckie and media universe, Matt? Uh, yeah, so uh, last Friday, David and I were on Left Link Vets, uh, their Twitch feed and their Colin show afterwards. And tonight I am doing more me- another media appearance on Ben Burgess's show to uh, an advance of his uh, going into the lines then with uh, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, Tim Poole and... Uh, I think James O'Keefe. Yes, yeah. it is James O'Keefe. Uh, uh, I am uh, familiar with that. Uh, so what we talked about those guys. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see if I can say something that gets him disinvited or something. It's weird. <laughs> one, one person from the left, and then I get. Uh, are they are they arguing that Tulsi Gabbard is probably? probably. Yeah, she's a leftist. Yeah, she endorsed Bernie Sanders after all. Whenever they uh, put her on Fox News, they put the D in parentheses next to her name. They might as well just, like, circle it in red. Like, this is what we're trying to yeah. do. They could add Brett Weinstein, and they could have three people who endorsed Bernie on the- oh, There you go. Them. And Joe Rogan. Yeah, Joe Rogan, too. On the left. Oh, my gosh. I just reordered, uh, Binder Dad says, I just reordered another two-pound bag of MR blend. Then they suggested the WTF blend. I declined. That is, Whoa. Uh, Mark was on last year, Matt, says two kids in a trench coat. Oh, really? 2017 was the recent, most was recent he? that came out. I can't remember. I don't I have no I don't remember that. Yeah. I don't recollect like that at all. All right, folks. Oh. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about what happened with Colbert because that oh, yeah. impacts somebody who comes on the show regularly. What happened with Colbert? Oh, his uh, crew. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We'll, be, uh, we'll talk about it in the fun half. See you in the fun half. 646-257-3920. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. On Matt! Who? Fun hat. What is up, everyone? Fun hat. No me key. You did it! Fun hat. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hat. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. Everyone, I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Uh, Yes. Yes. Is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go start Who libertarian? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him. So what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857. 210. 35. 501. One half. 38. 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. Six, $5,4. $3 trillion. Sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. <laughs> um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye.
a lot of controversy around these parts as to uh, when it was that Mark Marin was on the show, and uh, we're working on that. Um, 